Hi, I'm Tony Russo, and this is Funeral Service Insider from Kate Spoilston. Each episode features conversations about emerging trends and news that affect the death care industry. We talk to people who understand the delicate balance of change in a profession and vocation steeped in tradition. This week, I'm speaking with Tori Dixon, a funeral director and embalmer who expanded her purview of care to include mental health. We featured Tori in Funeral Service Insider this summer, um, talking about working with funeral directors who are dealing with grief, but she is also an expert on DEI, which I had to look up when I first started back in business writing. It stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Tori speaks passionately about how critical embracing DEI principles is for functioning in a changing society. Getting people to work for you means being able to work with people in a way it never has before. As always, please stick around for the postmortem after the closing credits. This week, I want to talk about our compensation survey, which ties pretty closely to the topic at hand. Um, But right now, let's um, hear from Tori after these words from our sponsor. Homesteaders traces its roots back to the early 1900s when the average family had to stretch $10 in weekly earnings for food, housing, and other essentials. An unexpected disruption, like the death of a loved one, could cripple their financial position, resulting in children as young as 10 entering the workforce. When Homesteaders issued its first policy in February 1906, they provided families with invaluable peace of mind, knowing they would not have to sacrifice their financial security to pay for a loved one's funeral. Homesteaders has persevered through some of the most profound periods of economic hardship, social unrest, and grief in American history. Two world wars, the stock market crash of 1929, the Great Depression, and two global pandemics. Homesteaders has weathered it all and never failed to pay a claim. Today, the company safeguards more than 800,000 families across the country. Homesteaders knows that pre-need is both a growth engine and a safeguard for funeral providers. For more than a century, they've built solutions tailored to the funeral profession, including their industry-leading account executive support, the profession's only true casket price protection program, and a library of technology solutions designed to connect funeral providers with more consumers than ever before. Homesteaders understands that when it comes to pre-need, one size fits all isn't the best fit. That's why they work with their customers to design pre-need programs that are custom built for your business, not anyone else's. Visit homesteaderslife.com today to find out why personalized pre-need starts with homesteaders. So we spoke earlier this year about um, about grief counseling because you are you are a grief counselor among other things, um, and I was really interested in your approach to to being a funeral director, but also finding other ways to serve your community. So can I get you to talk a little bit about just just to start a little bit about your background and then talk about how you kind of diversified your yourself to uh to be able to do what you wanted to do well tony thank you so much for having me on your program i really appreciate this opportunity um just to talk to any audience um that allows them to see me and to see hopefully a part of my story in themselves um i'll start a little bit back i graduated from the university of oklahoma Um, And then I went on to go to mortuary school in Decatur, Georgia, at Gupton Jones College of Funeral Service. And upon graduating from Gupton Jones, I began my career as as a funeral service practitioner at the time. Um, And so I worked with Grissom Eastlake Funeral Home at the time in Atlanta, Georgia, and I completed my apprenticeship hours and went on to become a licensed funeral director and mortician for the state of Georgia. I currently am a licensed funeral director and mortician in the state of Georgia. And I worked full time in the funeral service industry in several different arenas. So, of course, I started out as an apprentice and then I managed Grissom Eastlake um, with the owner, Mr. Clark. I was 
was um, the secretary and, you know, funeral arrangements, um, doing a little bit of dressing and casketing. Um, I did not do primarily any of the embalming. Um, and then I got my license as a pre-need insurance agent. So I did pre-need for the funeral home and was able to begin to do talks at different um, civic uh, organizations, different churches about the importance of pre-planning and pre-need um, for families in the in the community. From there, my career took almost a turn, if you will. Um, I uh, had an, a situation in my own personal family with a close loved one that dealt with severe mental illness. And at the time, we did not know um, what the diagnosis was or <laughs> what it would look like for the life of, of our family member at the time. And so I um, picked up my books again pen and pencil, went back to school and got my master's in mental health counseling from Walden University. Um, And then I began the process of merging these two seemingly different careers into one um, where I have been able to use both sides of my um, kind of an ambidextrous career, if you, you know, look at it in that way. Um, And I've been able to merge the experience that I have as a mortician into now my private practice, which is Graceful Journey Counseling Service, where I um, service uh, clients um, here in the state of Texas, as well as in the state of Georgia. So my clinical background is actually as a mortician, licensed mortician for 17 years. And it's the backdrop to what I do today. But the backdrop is also a very much important part of what I do as a uh, mental health counselor. One of the counselor. things that you mentioned when we spoke in, and the the article will will we'll have the article linked in the show notes. One of the things that you you said was that you tried to kind of counsel uh, young women specifically who are going into funeral service to not be afraid to diversify to find other ways that they can serve in addition to being a funeral director. Absolutely. I am a proponent of, you know, having a multifaceted um, career, especially in funeral service, because um, what we are coming to realize um, is that funeral service is a diversified um, area of practice, if you will, um, that we are going far beyond um, the traditional services of, um, you know, picking up a loved one who is deceased from their place of, uh, you know, where, where they, where they passed away, doing removals, doing funeral directing, doing embalming, having a funeral service. And now we are doing it's like a thing, services yeah. that we are now, um, <laughs> we've always been calling them celebration of life, but now it's a universal term now that we're doing. It's a thing now. And um, we've been calling them life celebrations, particularly in African-American firms, as, as far as I, I can remember. Um, And now it's become a universal theme in that we are actually providing an experience for the family. And it's not just about the funeral itself, but it is an entire experience. So the funeral home who's able to diversify their services um, will be able to capture a audience now with very short attention spans, right? So now that we have so many things to choose from, you'll be able to capture the attention of an audience if your funeral home and the funeral services that you provide are diverse enough to be able to meet the unique needs of any family that walks into the door. And in order for your firm to be able to do that, you have to have licensed professionals um, that is also diversified in the way that they see the world, in the way that they experience the world, in the way that they allow uh, the world to experience them. There has to be a diverse perspective in order for one to diversify their career and to be sustainable in this ever evolving space um, that we call Absolutely. funeral I, service. I couldn't agree more. I've been writing the last couple of weeks just about all of the, it's the changes that are occurring in the funeral service now are just, it's just blinding. Um, and, and I just stepped onto this moving yeah. train a, a year ago and, and everything that I knew a year ago isn't yeah. true anymore. So it's, it's shocking how quickly, you know, this is, uh, th- this industry has changed and, and will continue certainly continue to change. 
Absolutely. It will continue to change. Um, the more we are exposed to other cultures, the more information we have about the norms of what's going on in our world, right? And so now we have to have more of a global perspective because now we're dealing with more of a global um, community. Now, it's not just about what's happening in your city. It's not about what's happening in your state. Now you have to be aware of what's happening globally because now we are a global community. And whether or not you're advertising your funeral services on any social media platform, which if you aren't, you should be, um, this means that your content now is available to everybody around the world. So you're not just, your consumer now is not just the neighborhood family. Your consumer now is the person who may live in Italy or who may live in Germany or who may live in on in some country on the continent of Africa. And they want to know whether or not you're able to adhere to the customs that they have set in place. And would you be able to uh, transfer human remains from the United States to their country or from their country to the United States? So you have to be diverse and you have to be able to understand what's going on from a global perspective, because we are now a global and community. So let's talk a little bit about that. So first of all, how do you embrace it? And then how do you accomplish it? I guess are the, I guess is the two steps. You have to first accept that it's something you're willing and interested in doing, and then you have to do it. <laughs> and, Absolutely. And so, and so Absolutely. talk about the, that, that kind of that, those two steps in the process, sir. I mean, I will say to any funeral home owner, manager, um, whether you are a mom and pop firm or whether you are a part of a conglomerate, if you're not willing um, to allow yourself to be immersed in what's going on in the world, you're going to be left behind. Um, you won't be able to um, sustain because again, your your consumer now is not just the family that's next door, right? As a matter of fact, because we are such a transient society, there's very few people who actually live in the city and state that they were born in or that their parents were born in. So if for no other reason, if you are a funeral home, let's just say in Florida, and you are not open to understanding the customs of how a family right. has funeral service, say in the Northeast, you're missing out on clientele. You're missing out on your customer, your consumer now, your niche market isn't just the family next door. It's everybody. And so if you're not willing to open your eyes and give yourself permission to step outside of the box, then you are going to miss out on the dollars that your business, because you're in business to make money, and you will miss out on money if you are unwilling to diversify your perspective. Secondly, I would say no business owner should be so close-minded that they don't want to grow. If you want to get better, if your business, if you want your business to grow, you have to grow. And your business will only grow as far as you do. As the leader, as the trendsetter of your company, it's only going to go as far as you go. And so if you limit your knowledge and your information, if that becomes the glass ceiling, then you can only expect that your business will only grow um, to, to, to how far you and grow. What, it's going to be limited by your limited perspective. So you can look at it that way. What are some of the ways that you think you can show that, that you do have this, this openness? What are some of the signals that you can kind of put out there so people know? So if just people, so people who aren't even just afraid to ask whether you know or not, you know, how do you, how do you appear more open to people who might be, you know, apprehensive about yeah. So, so, so I'd say I'd say one of the ways that you know whether or not your business is diversified is look look at your staff, right? Does everybody look like you? Does everybody believe the way you believe? Does everybody experience the world the way that you experience it? If the answer to that question is yes, then you're probably about ten years behind um, this moving vehicle, like you right. call it, this freight train that's kind of coming at you. Um, and and it's not just about um, race or even religion. It's about having a transgenerational perspective on funeral service. Um, before, as a funeral home, you know, manager and as a as a mortician, as a woman, we would have to wear pantyhose. We couldn't have our nails a certain length or color. You were very conservative, and now you have 
of Absolutely. people coming into the industry, right? That have open tattoos. They are they are willing to express themselves. You have families now that are asking that, well, when your staff comes and works the service, we want them to wear jeans and a white shirt because that's what yeah. our loved one liked. And so not just about the obvious, ask yourself questions, things like, do I have, again, a transgenerational perspective? Is everybody on my staff 50 and over? If it is, I'm missing out on, on, some, on some clients, right? Because we know everybody's dying, right? Um, I have families right. that ask for different type of music to be played as opposed to maybe traditional hymns or any sort of religious pieces. They're asking for other music. Do you know what other music, you know, is available out there? Are you are you on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or any of right. these other social media platforms? And if you're like, well, we don't even know how to get on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, you're 10 years behind. And so it's time for you to hire somebody that can get your funeral home on social media, because that's where people uh, that's where they're finding their businesses now. There's no more yellow pages. Right. We used to have the the white book, I think, of funeral service. I can't it, remember it, what it was. It was the yellow we book. published it, actually. The Kate, Kate Spoils did <laughs> yes. actually publish that. Every now and again, I'll get a phone call and somebody will say, do you still publish that book? And I'm like, no, not not for like a decade. I don't, I don't think. Yes. Yeah. You don't you don't have that anymore. Everyone now is online. And if you're not online, if you are not advertising on social media, then you are behind. And nobody knows about your funeral home except for the people that live in your area. We're going to take a little break right now because I want to talk to you about American Funeral Director Magazine, the flagship of all of the things that we do here at Kate Spoilston Publications. Our company has been covering the funeral industry for almost 150 years, and American Funeral Director has led the way that entire time. It is a monthly must-read that covers the crucial topics every funeral professional should be informed about. Inside every month of American Funeral Director, you'll find our regular features such as In the Know and Five Questions, which delve into specific topics interesting to funeral directors. We also publish news and investigative features that are written with funeral directors in mind and from the perspective of people who genuinely understand the space. We're really proud of our magazine and we work real hard on it and we want you to read it. And so what we're doing this month is offering a special exclusive subscription price for our listeners. You can subscribe now to American Funeral Director for $12 for your first year. That's a steal for the wealth of knowledge that you'll gain. Don't miss out on this opportunity to elevate your expertise. Get leading voices in the funeral profession right at your fingertips and right to your mailbox. To get access to this special offer, just click on the link in the show notes and it will bring you to a page where you can sign up and start getting American Funeral Director next month. Kate Spoilston Publications, your trusted partner in the funeral industry for over a century. Stay informed, stay ahead, and let us guide you on your professional journey. Subscribe today because knowledge is power and success begins with staying informed. Kate Spoilston Publications, where the past, present, and future of the funeral profession come together. I was speaking with a funeral director not too long ago. I'm going to be oblique because it's not a pleasant story. And um, the the funeral director said to me, he said, when when someone comes in, if they have tattoos, you know, I always treat them well and I interview them, but I'm, I don't hire people with tattoos. And I'm like, eventually you're not going to, you can't also, you can't not hire people with tattoos and also complain that there's a staffing shortage. You know, <laughs> those two things don't go together. Yeah. yeah. You won't have anybody to work for you. And you will be a funeral home of one and you can't run your funeral home by yourself. You need a, a support system. And again, if you happen to be running your funeral home by yourself, it's time for you to say, I've got to diversify my perspective because um, I, I can't be the only voice that I'm listening to. I have to have some other voices in the room 
so that we can continue to actually do business and, and be a business. I want to I want to yes yes and but but you because it does seem like it may be a little bit easier said than done. Like, how do I go out and find someone who doesn't look like me and hire them? You know, how do I how do I how do I advertise that job? You know, how do I, how do I find how do I find someone oh. who will enhance my um, my business? Can I tell you that the overall concern with that is that probably you th- this individual is probably living a monolithic monolithic life, right? Um, um, and so that means that your personal life isn't diverse enough for you to have access to the people that can bring a level of diversity to your space. So that means that everybody you hang out with, they worship with you. They, uh, they shop at the same places you shop. They entertain at the same places that you entertain. Um, again, it's very monolithic. So usually diversity in a business setting is only going to work as well as diversity is working in your personal life and in your personal setting. And I will say that creating diversity is going to require you to step outside of some comfort zones that you may have been living your life in all of your life. Right? Not even because, known. and not have e- not even known it because it's very easy to say, well, there's nobody here like this. And nowadays, that's probably less true <laughs> than it was, say, 20 that's, years that's ago, true, yeah. right? <laughs> so if you're still saying, well, I don't know anybody like that, then I would say maybe even look at your own personal life and see how diverse your own personal life is. And that will give you a really good indicator as to why you're having a challenging time diversifying your business. And that's a, that's a, a, such an excellent point. A, a couple of years ago, I was in a grocery store and I, I'm sorry. So I grew up in New Jersey. I'm, I'm from, I'm from the Northeast. I'm from a heavily populated area, but now I live in the, mm-hmm. in the rural, in rural Maryland. And I was in mm-hmm. a, I was in a grocery store and I heard a foreign language that wasn't Spanish. And I was like, Oh my goodness, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> this is, mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're getting diverse here now too. And I, when you said that, it, it's, it's funny because it had never occurred to me that there are still pockets in the country where, uh, where other people haven't gone yet or haven't, haven't, you know, there aren't enough, there's not enough diversity in them yet, or it's just getting diverse enough now where there's a, a third language you might hear in, in, uh, in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Look for them, seek them out. Um, And this is the thing. If you are not in diversity, doesn't happen by chance. It's not happenstance. You actually have to be intentional about it, whether it's in your personal life or whether it's in your business space. If you are not intentional about seeking out different perspectives, then yes, you will say things like, we don't have quote unquote those type of people here. And it's like, well, what type of people are you talking about? Right? Because you have to be intentional. You have to make it a part of your lifestyle that you are going to diversify your perspective so that you can have a clearer picture of how the world operates. If you only know how the world operates because of the way you live in it, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it. and and it's dangerous. It's dangerous to just have a one, a one eye view of the way that the world works, because the way that the world is working differently for all of us. And if you don't have a perspective of that, that can be dangerous in more ways. I know. Than I do one. want to move a little bit into into equity because that is that's a little bit that's a little bit slipperier because everyone thinks they're fair. Everyone thinks they have a good sense of humor. <laughs> everyone thinks they're fair. And it's not true. <laughs> and so how do you, how do you, how do you mm-hmm. know if you're running an mm-hmm. equitable business? How do you know if you're being equitable among your employees? How do you know if you are projecting equity as a, as a business owner um, to the community? Well, the first thing that you have to do is dismantle your idea of what's fair. Because fairness is never going to lead to equity. So. If fairness is at the top of your list right. and it's, it is a, um, you know, it's something that you believe in that things have to be fair, 
then chances are things won't be equitable. Because well, can you, yes, please tell me tell. So let's talk about the difference then between fairness and equity. So fairness says the way that I like to describe fairness is kind of in two ways. Whenever you are speaking of something being fair, you're looking at who's right. When you're looking at something that's equitable or just, you're asking what's right. Ah. And usually when we, when we throw our weight on the side of what's right, then we usually have as an outcome equitable. When you are looking at who's right, you're always going to look at what's fair and the people who are needing more to make the equation equitable are always going to be in the lower category, if you will. It's never going to be fair if we if our goal is it for it to be equitable. Okay. So like um, you know, um there is this picture that I use in my in my uh my talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they have three people kind of um, different heights. And then when they say equality, they kind of give everybody the same step stool to stand on. But if the guy is already short and he can't see over the fence and there's a guy who's six feet tall, if you give them all the same step up, then they're also going to be in the same position and the shorter person isn't going to be able to see over the I was think still. that's the, the very picture I had in my head. I, I'm more violent. I thought of I thought of maybe floodwaters. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's let's be a little less violent. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's let's, that's the very picture I had in my mind. Right? So and so, but if I want it to be equitable. This means that the person who's inherently taller is going to need less help than the person who's inherently shorter. So I'm going to have to give the person who's shorter more, quote unquote, than the person who's already tall and can see over the fence. Right. But true equity would mean that nobody would be behind the fence in the first place. Yes. (laughs) Right. That everybody actually will be in a position where we all can enjoy what needs to be enjoyed without there being an impediment for anybody. And so, and I guess a workplace, it seems as if it would be, I need to find out what my employees, what each individual employee needs to succeed, not what everybody should get and be able to succeed with. Absolutely. Because if you have one employee who says, you know what? I am a stay-at-home parent um, and I am unwed and I have a little one that has to be picked up by 530. So I may not can work awake or visitation, um, you know, at six from 6 to 7 p.m. But you have one employee who doesn't have that restriction, right? And they're like, man, I have to work that late. But then the other employee may say, but I can be here at 7 a.m. to embalm that body or dress that or dress that body and get the chapel prepared for the service before everybody else gets here at nine. Right. So if I say everybody comes in at seven, that doesn't help. But when I know the needs of my employee, when I have relationship with them then I can give myself permission to make the space equitable so that everyone can be successful at their job. Remember that when we're asking about equitableness and we're talking about something being equitable, we're asking for justice and we want the space to have an air of being just. So that means that it, it works for everybody, not just one person and not just one group of people, not it works for everybody. That way we are using our staff and we are using the resources of our company only to solve problems and not to figure out who's right and who's that's, wrong. That's so well put because I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking exactly that. It would be like, well, it's not fair to give people, you know, different schedules, but it is equitable to give people different schedules. Absolutely. It's equitable. And what we want at the end of the day, when we prioritize providing the best service that our company can provide for our community, 
we're going to make sure that things being equitable is is at the top of our list because at the end of the day the problem right, right. is making sure that we're able to serve the community right okay that's ultimately and our goal as we as we as we kind of pull into the station here let's let's give a little we already touched on inclusion when we were going through through diversity but i i would like to pull it out as it's as its own topic um what, how is signaling that you're an inclusive place different from signaling that you're a diverse place? And what are the important parts of doing that? I love that question because diversity doesn't always mean inclusion. You can be a very diverse company and be very exclusive. Inclu- inclusivity means that not only do I need your difference to make the, make the space diverse, but I also need your ideas. So now I'm not just inviting you to the party. I'm actually giving you a seat at the table. And not only are you just sitting at the table, but I'm passing you the microphone so that we can hear your voice. Uh. Inclusivity means that your voice also matters. It matters in the decisions that we make for the company. It matters in the changes that we make within the company. I don't need you to just invite me into the room, but mute me. Why am I here? Because then that's performance work. That's when you're doing performance work. That's when you're just, you just have me here just so that I can be your token, your loan, your whatever it is. But if my voice is not welcomed when it comes to policymaking and decisions within the realm of your company, then I'm also, I'm not included. Look at your board of director and look at your managers. Does the managers in your company represent the staff and the people that work there? Right. We, I, it's, it's, it's so funny. Right. I just, I interviewed the, uh, the head of carriage services and that's what he's, he, mm-hmm. he, he got to a, a board and he's like, we need to shake this board up for the very reasons that you were just saying. He said, I looked around and this is not yeah. the, <laughs> this, this, this board doesn't represent the faces of our employees. Yeah. That means that he has made an effort and he's making an effort to include that there needs to be inclusion because no matter, again, remember when we talked about diversity and I said, you, a diverse perspective is not just how you experience the world, right. but how other people experience it. And when you start to um, prioritize inclusivity, that means that I'm also interested in the way that you are moving about in the world. And I understand that the world sees you differently and that you have a different perspective and that you have a different experience. Not that one is better or one is worse. They're just different. Mm. And if they're different, then that means that I, as a board person, I have to have an understanding of how you are experiencing the world differently than I am. And if that difference is Uh, means that now we have an equity issue, Mm. then now it's my responsibility to implement equity policies so that the way you are experiencing the world is considered in all the other factors in the things that we are doing in our company. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, We are are up against it. So I want to, I want to go to put the brakes on right, right here. Um, but I do want to ask you because I know that you are active yeah. socially. If you'd like to, if you'd like to say where, where people can find you socially and on the internet. Yes. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at when Tory talks. Um, and those are the, and you can find me at graceful journey Um, that's our website. Um, and again, we run a successful, um, practice and, um, I also do diversity, and equity, and inclusion um, talks and trainings um, for funeral service professionals um, in particular, um, because I understand how the funeral service industry works and what works well in um, attempting to include those very three important principles in growing your company um, and better serving your community. Excellent. And thank you so much. What a wonderful, wonderful guest. We will, we will have you back on in the, in the, in the nearest future, um, to talk about something else. Cause you're uh, just an, an absolute delight. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. It has been my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Homesteaders traces its roots back to the early 1900s when the average family had to stretch $10 in weekly earnings for food, housing, and other essentials. An unexpected disruption, like the death of a loved one, could cripple their financial position, resulting in children as young as 10 entering the workforce. 
When Homesteaders issued its first policy in February 1906, they provided families with invaluable peace of mind, knowing they would not have to sacrifice their financial security to pay for a loved one's funeral. Homesteaders has persevered through some of the most profound periods of economic hardship, social unrest, and grief in American history. Two world wars, the stock market crash of 1929, the Great Depression, and two global pandemics. Homesteaders has weathered it all and never failed to pay a claim. Today, the company safeguards more than 800,000 families across the country. Homesteaders knows that pre-need is both a growth engine and a safeguard for funeral providers. For more than a century, they've built solutions tailored to the funeral profession, including their industry-leading account executive support, the profession's only true casket price protection program, and a library of technology solutions designed to connect funeral providers with more consumers than ever before. Homesteaders understands that when it comes to pre-need, one size fits all isn't the best fit. That's why they work with their customers to design pre-need programs that are custom built for your business, not anyone else's. Visit homesteaderslife.com today to find out why personalized pre-need starts with homesteaders. Funeral Service Insider, the podcast is a Kate Spoilston production. It was written and edited by me, Tony Russo. I've already said it, but I will say it again. Make sure you check out the show notes because that's where all the great stuff is. You can get in touch with Tori through there. You can get in touch with me through there. And it is also where you can take advantage of these special introductory subscription prices. Um, we'll have special ones on American Funeral Director as well as American Cemetery and even FSI in the coming weeks. Um, if you have any feedback that you'd like to leave, you can send me an email. My email address is a russo, R-U-S-S-O, at K like kite, B like boy, publications.com. Again, easiest to just go to the show notes and you can just click from there. I also always say subscribe where you're listening now and please do. But we're available on Spotify and on Apple and on Amazon and pretty much any place you get podcasts. If you prefer to do YouTube, we are on YouTube and if you subscribe, then you get the show right away. You won't have to remember, oh, I haven't heard from Tony in a while. I should go see if there's a new podcast. Now, for the postmortem. When the November 30th issue of Funeral Service Insider comes out, it will be the last in a series of reports based on our Kate Boylston compensation survey. We've been doing it for a decade. We've been doing it for 10 years. And this year, we put it all together um, which is something we've never done before. Also this year, as we were putting it together, AI became incredibly popular. So we used some of the AI tools at our ex exposure. So we used some of the AI tools at our disposal to cut into the information in ways we couldn't have done even last year. It's really exciting. And the reason I'm telling you is that even if you're not a subscriber to Funeral Service Insider, although you should be, you can get a copy of the report probably in December. So keep an eye out for that. The reason I think the big takeaway, and it was something that Tori was getting at for this entire episode, is um, the way we relate to our employees is the beginning and the end of how well we're going to be able to do in the future. Uh, compensation has changed radically. People want more money and they want to work less. And it's not something that's easy to do, but there are ways. And we've had so many experts help us with this report and dig into ways that we can listen to what the employees are saying without necessarily giving away the store either. So please check out the upcoming final edition if you're a subscriber, if you're not. And I'm sure I'll say it again here when it comes out um, in December. And also in December, we will have uh, Bill Ford, who is the president of Sesco Management Consultants. And he's going to talk about some of the uh, nitty gritty parts of the report that you can focus on and easily make a couple little changes, things about benefits, the changing attitudes 
about benefits among employees to changing attitudes about raises and ways to rethink um, Merry Christmas, uh, how desperately you need to pay bonuses and if they're doing what you want to do. Anyway, tons of stuff coming up. I'm very excited for the new year. I'm very excited to get this uh, report into your hands. Um, We worked really hard on it as a team. So that's all I have for this time. And I will, oh, I'm sorry, happy Thanksgiving. I guess this is Thanksgiving week if you're listening to it when it comes out. So happy Thanksgiving. I will be going to see my family, which is one of the best parts of the holiday. I mean, I guess, you know, the things that I do with my family are also the best parts. And having the, the turkey executed is always is always a big thing for me. Um, but now that is it. Have a happy Thanksgiving. And I will talk to you next time on Funeral Service Insider, the podcast. <laughs>